Hello and uh, welcome to another session of Ek Mulakat Vishesh. The guest for today's session is Dr. Amrish Mittal. Prabha Khetan Foundation is a foundation based in Kolkata, founded by late Dr. Prabha Khetan. The foundation is dedicated to promoting performing arts, culture, education, literature, gender equality, and women's empowerment. It collaborates with the caregivers, committed individuals, and like-minded institutions to implement cultural, educational, literary, and social welfare projects in India. In these trying times, when all of us are struggling to keep ourselves updated on healthcare, we are most happy to welcome our guest of today, Dr. Amrish Mittal. Dr. Amrish Mittal is a Padma Bhushan and BC Roy awardee. He is the chairman and head of endocrinology and diabetes department at Max Healthcare, PanMax, a group of 16 hospitals. He is uh, the domain expert on the governing board of National Health Authority 2019 of India and president of AIMS Gorakhpur. Recently was presented the Laureate Award from Endocrine Society of US for international excellence. Dr. Mittal has been the recipient of the Pogarty Fellowship from Harvard Medical School, Japan International Cooperation Agency Fellowship, Boy Film Award of the ASPMR, IOF Amgen Health Professional Award, and the Springer Citation Prize for his paper on global vitamin D status in 2013. He has received the IOF President's Award in 2016. His current research interests include vitamin D nutrition, primary hyperparathyroidism, osteoporosis, cardiovascular outcome trials in diabetes, and NAFLT. In a conversation with him is Ms. Ina Puri. She is a writer, biographer, art curator, uh, collector, and SRS woman from Gurugram. Now I would request the audience to sit, sit back and relax and enjoy the conversation. And I invite Dr. Mittal and Ms. Puri to begin the conversation. Thank you very much. And a very warm welcome to you all once again. Thank you. Ina. <clears throat> Thank you very, very much for inviting us, Prabha Khetan Foundation, and thank you for that wonderful introduction. Uh, good evening, everybody, and a very good evening to Dr. Mittal, whom I've now known for almost about 22 years. Uh, I would like to begin this conversation by asking Dr. Mittal, about the pandemic, it has been an incredibly tragic time, a time when we really didn't know what to expect. It was like one crisis after another crisis was, was there before us. And at some points it felt like we didn't know how to cope with it. Yet there you were, a frontliner working with the rest. And gradually, bit by bit, I would like to think that we have seen the worst of the pandemic. Would you like to reassure us and tell us if the pandemic is really over? Thank you, Ina. It's an honor and a privilege to be here. Uh, thanks to the foundation for inviting me, giving me this opportunity. Yes, Ina, about the pandemic, as you've seen, it's, uh, it's really exploded in our face in, in, in March and April this year. Uh, and regardless of what people might say in, in, in retrospect, I don't think any expert had predicted the velocity or the ferocity of the pandemic. You can always say they didn't do that and they didn't do this. But the truth is that uh, nowhere had people expected such a rapid onset of, of, of spread of the virus and uh, such a diffuse sort of uh, spread, which would encompass almost everybody, where it reached, it just encompassed everybody. So while those who thought there would not be a second wave were just being plain naive or hopeful, but but though even the best could not figure out how severe it was. So I would also like to think that the worst is over. The signs are that, I mean, it's hard to exceed what we've been through, uh, but there will be some resurgence. So as the lockdown opens up, 
in in as we unlock as they say in various parts of india and it's happening uh, there will be some increase in the cases and i think at the moment that should be manageable now the problem here is the two issues here i think it is a fight between the vaccine and the variants and i'll explain that the faster we can vaccinate the better off we are number 1 number 2 if the virus and that's virus behavior doesn't mutate again and come out with some nasty new form yes resistant to the previous infection antibodies and not covered by the vaccine if that doesn't happen then things will be under control but if the another variant takes over like the delta plus then of course no one can predict so we are all hoping that the worst is over and our immunity uh, you know which is conferred by the sudden surge as well as the vaccine will see us through so let's wait and watch yes and also what has happened doc is that you have the experience now you know how to deal with this virus the, the, the past one and a half years you know you've been researching and your whole team has been working there right right in the front and uh, learning better how to cope with this uh, vicious virus wouldn't you say also the vaccinations that have happened we have done almost 80 lakh vaccinations day before yesterday if i'm not mistaken yes and 63 i think the next day so it's pretty good so so i think the vaccination program has really taken off there'll always be the naysayers who will find fault with everything and clearly the vaccination program was limping in between for a period yes. of some uh, Uh, issue about supplies and about policy and placing orders but i think at least for the moment we are back on track and uh, reaching those numbers is is huge credit to the whole team that is working on it that will definitely save us there's no question that will be a major uh, effort in our in our uh, in our efforts to combat the virus that will be a major part of it uh, and yes of course the management has improved considerably Yeah. yeah, considerably outcomes. You know, so the problem that happened in the second wave was that it became so huge that there was no place to even admit patients and manage them. But I hope that won't happen again. I think the government is prepared. The hospitals are prepared. God forbid if there is some minor surge, I think it can be taken care of. So where we stand today, the, we are uh, we are looking at a situation where the second wave is behind us, and there is the possibility of the third wave coming. but we are better equipped to deal with it today definitely definitely undoubtedly yeah and in the middle of course there are these variants and uh, scare of the black fungus and the the yellow fungus all these things which we've never even heard of in our lives so all of this is very frightening i think all of us are terrified we don't know what to expect next so the black fungus story in one line is basically what happened with the rampant use of steroids because people couldn't reach hospitals they started steroids on their own and by the time they reached hospital they were already in bad shape so uh, when you use high dose steroids and if you have blood glucose problems initially then you increase the risk of this mucormycosis of black fungus so it's it's something that i would not have seen as many cases in my lifetime as i have seen in the last uh, you know one or two months so it it's a sequel sequel of of the of the infection and i mean it really it it flows from the same thing when you get such a severe infection and such a massive spread such a massive uh, sort of such vast numbers being affected then you get into all these troubles so hopefully all that is also yes. also doc you couldn't really blame these people uh a lot of us friends or members of the family who couldn't make it to hospitals oxygen wasn't available hospital rooms icu ventilators were not available so they did the next best thing they treated themselves which somehow boomeranged and i mean how were they to know that these steroids which would help bring the you know their fever down would you know there there would be a sting in the tail and it would come back and hit them like this so it's a catch 22 yeah. actually So I will tell you, you know, I think those about two to three weeks were the worst period of my professional life, because not only were you flooded with with calls and all that happens, you know, but but the fact that you could not help people exactly that's going to stay with me a long time. You could not help people whom you knew very well, people who were your patients for twenty years, fifteen years, your friends, your family. Even then, you could not help. because you couldn't get them a hospital bed there was a short period where you couldn't get them a hospital bed you couldn't get them oxygen you no. know that that's what they need otherwise they may not survive but you couldn't do anything for them 
So mm-hmm. as a doctor, I think that was really the most depressing phase uh, of a professional career. But I don't want to see that again, and I hope it doesn't happen ever again. Yet, doctor, you were available uh, online continuously. I can vouch for this because I myself had COVID, and uh, not just because you're my friend, but you were available, and I could just pick up the phone and speak with you. And I think that that really helped the fact that I could hear your voice or I could speak to you. And also, what has happened in the last one and a half years is that your, uh, you know, the way you look at patients or this this whole system has changed now you can't sit across the table what you need at the end of the day is a per, is, is your doctor reassuring you that it's all going to be all right now it's just a voice on the phone because you can't it's so infectious this virus that you can't meet your doctor i think that's a uh, that's a huge challenge it's a challenge for doctors too yes how you develop bonds with your patient how do patients develop faith in you you chat with them now you, you can't see them they can't hear you they can't see you my patients come and say that you've changed suddenly i said i've not changed you know what's happened to you so so and i they can't hear me the older patients they can't hear me i have a mask they have a mask and and there's a plastic curtain in between so it's and you know we teach younger doctors that you have to bond with your patient hold an old lady's hand who's who's anxious about having lost someone in the family put an arm around the patient's shoulder if the patient is very exactly happy. that is gone and we used to say if you go on the rounds on the ward rounds and if you haven't held the patient's hand or touched his forehead the round is not complete you can't just go and talk like that and now we say you stand at the door almost and take the round yes so there is a whole thing human factor which has taken a big beating in this exactly technology at least the medical part of it we've been able to deliver to a large extent using technology like we're using now so there is a the, i mean this thing another 50 years ago 40 years ago maybe even 30 years ago in india would have created much more havoc at least we have these tools to connect with each other now i just wanted to ask you doc that when this was happening and you were uh, seeing patients and you of course there was some connection with with, uh, with, with infected people uh, so uh, what i was going to ask you is that how did you keep yourself safe how did you keep your sanity intact so i think uh, there uh, what we learned last year helped us a lot because last year we were paranoid about touching about fomite infections and hand washing and which is still important and and you know coming home and every time then then changing your putting your clothes in the wash every time going to a different bathroom keeping that area separate and we were doing all those things but the year taught us that really that's a very minor mode of spread if you are masking yourself really properly and yes. it's maintaining distance then hands are important to wash you would always wash your hands but they are not the critical mode of transmission yes we in some sense that anxiety about spraying the you know table after every patient or the chair, all that we don't do that anymore yes exactly. yes yes so that really helped to keep ourselves safe it was masking distancing spending least amount of time in a closed environment seeing the patient with an open room coming home you know washing properly taking leaving the mask disposing it off outside the house i think that that's the only thing that we did this time last time was much worse in terms of uh, precautions but i have something to say i'm so envious that despite your pressures every morning you manage to go for a walk and you take the most incredible pictures the photographs are something we look forward to every morning the you know the evening before the sky the clouds the peacocks i think uh, it's it's it gives you a sense of uh, of tranquility you know when you walk and you look at nature around you i it's it's amazing but you do well, thank you ina and i think everyone needs some uh, sanity some tranquility so what i try to do in general life is also very busy but the pandemic made it very different uh, uh, so you have to find i have to find something to keep me happy every day one happy thought that carries me through the day amongst all the stresses and strains so i can go back to it whenever i feel like in my mind although i may be doing something else altogether and that one happy thought that happy thought could be especially during the pandemic it was uh, because of less pollution we got amazing views of sunrise and sunsets because of uh, you know delhi being full of parks and i i made it a mission to go to all of them 
and and yeah. you know call my driver at 5:30 a.m. and just go there and just walk through them and there's so many peacocks and so many nice things uh, and 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 you know greenery of different kinds and you know the beautiful parks of Delhi and then I added to that. This is again from my own thing. I added to that history. So what I did was that I visited in Delhi, maybe the only city which has so many parks with with so much history in them, monuments. So I thought we only, uh, you know, not being a humanities student or history student or anything, uh, you know, I'm very interested in history. So I thought that you know maybe I should visit parks which are pre-Mughal. So I started with the first one, and that turned out to be right next door in in Vasant Kuhn Sultan. Yes. So we went. Through, so I went through all the monuments. So and and then click clicking of pictures for me is not. I mean I'm not a photographer, and I don't. I've never used a camera. It's only the phones that have advanced that have uh, uh, enabled me to take these uh, capture these pictures. And then it just stays. And then you know I like to look at them, and some people also like to look at them. So it just becomes a sort of thing. So, Wonderful. But do you miss? I know that you're a regular at art exhibitions. That you're a art collector yourself. You have the most. Fabulous works of uh, Jayasree Barman, Parish Maithi, so many other artists. But uh, do you miss physically looking at art, going to exhibitions? Of course, I do. I mean, there, where's the question? I mean, it's as I said, it's firstly the the impact of a physical viewing of something is different from the impact of viewing it on 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 screen, and also the human interaction. I mean, that's very important. I'm, I'm, you know. a people's person in that sense yes and who will uh, happily i like to be alone but not for too long you know human interaction for me which is perhaps why i enjoy medicine human interaction for me is very important and and suddenly you are cut off from that and so it's not the same thing and similarly for music you know i mean music is the other thing that keeps me going so yeah. so hindustani classical but i enjoy everything from kishore kumar to whatever so uh, you know going to a bathhouse just takes it takes everything away you know and just just takes you to a different plane where you can switch off from so many things and come back with a certain kind of satisfaction and feeling that you will not get uh, you know uh, otherwise so mm-hmm. definitely i miss the physical interaction of of concerts and of art galleries and meeting friends and and discussing the performance or discussing the painting that's all gone but hopefully by the end of the year we should be able to meet again under happier circumstances doc i think there will be lots of questions aradhana do you just want to share some of those questions on the screen nadi you can continue for another 10 minutes we've not asked for the questions the questions have not still come in oh because i thought i saw aradhana on the screen and i thought 30 minutes were over no i think okay. we- oh that's great that's great so doc we have stayed we have 10 minutes more yeah but you know the thing is that uh, that's what i miss most of all you know it's just not looking at the art it's chatting with people it's having a cup of coffee afterwards the interaction that happens in an art event or a book event for for that matter and yeah. that is what you really miss so undoubtedly yeah, i mean there is no substitute for that well, yes you will try i mean you know it, 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 and i just hope that that kind of because that is what makes you human actually yes you can't be human unless you have human interactions yes and, and uh, we just hoping that we are seeing the tailing off of this now and the third wave whenever and whatever is is a small wave and i think that uh, that uh, we should be able to resume our resume some sort of enjoyment some kind of pleasures of life uh, again uh, harmless pleasures of life again yes which have really uh, now eluded us for more than a year i mean i haven't yeah. traveled in one and a half years So but doc have you ever thought of writing i mean if you look at siddharth mukherjee's the gene or paul kalinithi's book breath of air these yes. are these are beautiful books and i don't think i enjoyed reading them with the kind of intensity that i did you know like 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 a, like in recent uh, months because there was you know all you did was you were you were indoors and you had all the time in the world to read to pick up a book and read and i reread these books and that was my question is that have you ever thought of writing yourself your experiences 
many a time you know and many publishers have also actually uh, been chasing me but i'm scared to commit because of uh, a schedule that is very in some sense punishing you can say or at least i can yes. if you like yes so it requires a certain frame of mind so while i can do short articles which i do regularly yes hard for me to commit to a book but i would very much be willing to write about experiences or there are two kinds of books you can do so one is one i could do a book for my patients about you know about diabetes and my experience with the diabetes and that will be useful there are too many sort of quick fix kind of books but a more personalized kind of book uh, yeah and that's and the other is i could write about my experiences in general which some people have been asking me to do uh, you know uh, about all these things and people have even suggested i should write uh, one pages on the monuments i have visited that's and right with pictures, with pictures. <laughs> so i found that funny i said but who'll read what i want to write about this they might read what i want to write about diabetes or osteoporosis but not a fun this you never know you never know uh, but that is an idea i'm sure that's in your head because you're taking your get your pictures are getting better every day virtually i think especially the cloud series <laughs> quite quite beautiful but it's very interesting that your son is a photographer yes. and his subjects are are so different from yours he does people i mean his whole focus is you know he likes to shoot people and with you it's nature and it's birds and it's the skies and it's 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 so interesting to see this contrast so maybe the next exhibition we can think of his father and son together <laughs> so that that is happening but so uh, have you not been traveling have you just been uh, under lockdown yourself or have you been able to manage to travel no i've uh, it's just been uh, hospital and home hospital and home Uh, and a few parks thrown in in the morning, but nothing else. I haven't visited a friend <coughs> for one and a half years. I I, I really haven't. Uh, we've interacted only through such media, but yes, uh, had any good social interaction. And I haven't. I took a one day break on the holy day, uh, holy day as in holy, the festival. Uh, and uh, uh, what happened was that uh, I saw this uh, flash on my. Twitter or somewhere about the tulip gardens in Kashmir. I know, I saw that. Yes, it was a completely crazy thing, and cases were really down in Delhi at that point. Uh, they hadn't. They started picking up a little bit, but we were nowhere near the the surge that happened. And uh, it was a holiday, so it, uh, so it, Sunday, Monday it became holiday. So I said, you know, I'll do some. And my brother is there in in Srinagar. So you know, I said I'll just make a dash. So completely crazy, out of character for me. I I just you know booked a ticket and just went off alone and spent a day at the tulip gardens and it was very much worth it. Oh, very, very much. Worth it. it was amazing, absolutely. That's We've the seen the tulip part. gardens in Amsterdam, but we have very few people have been to Kashmir, and I think it's definitely something that that one should do. It's very interesting. They are building a cherry blossom uh, garden there also. The whole area is exquisitely oh. maintained and very professionally done. Very nice. There's so much to do within our own country. What I'm thinking, maybe one could think of doing during the pandemic season, is that if you're unable to travel, make long distance uh, travel happen, is within the country there are so many places that you can drive down to. I think, but when will it be safe to travel? When do you think we'll get our normal lives back? Well, I think we'll have to wait a couple of months to figure out about this uh, so-called third wave and what happens if if that really leaves us alone. Uh, then it will not be too bad, and if we can vaccinate, and I'm sure the vaccination part will happen uh, to a large extent. So, so if the vaccine works against the newer mutants or variants, then I suppose we are pretty safe. But if it doesn't, it's really up in the air. We're really chasing the virus. The virus is calling the shots. But doc, tell me something. We don't even know after the second shot. Most of us have received. Lots of us have received the second jab. but whether we need another uh, you know kind of a booster shot we don't know there's no vaccine for children it's still not we are not in the clear yet no, no, there's nothing not. for children so that's another big worry so i think they will have a vaccine their trials already started on children so they will have some vaccines for children but then that's another issue can you send children to school without vaccination till when will they not go to school so that's another issue and the uh, booster shots my gut feeling is almost certainly will be required 
Oh. So, so uh, I think that's another thing that I'm, I'm trying to put up to authorities also that by December we'll be in line for our boosters. If, if healthcare workers again are exposed, then again the whole system goes. So we, so by December or January we'll need a shot. I'm pretty sure we will. The way it's going right now. But doc, tell me, without you were also without vaccination like everyone else for a longish while when this pandemic had hit when it began. Yes, yes, we were without vaccinations. We got it in January, the first shot, February, the first shot. And typically the immunity kicks in for the variants also uh, about two weeks after the second shot. Mm. So by, by the time the second surge was happening, uh, most healthcare workers who had got the vaccine on time uh, were at least moderately protected. So that was a good thing. Mm. 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 If we had started vaccination earlier, we could have protected many more people, but I think it's not. It's easier said than done. It's many. easier said than done. And I think what is happening now uh, through the pandemic is that we are learning from each other. I mean, even as we speak, London is already well into its third wave. But in New York, people are partying in Chicago. Yeah. Art exhibitions and galleries are yeah. open. And we are so enviously watching friends visit these galleries. So in different countries, and China has suddenly gone silent. So all these uh, things that are happening, I think that, that every day we learn as to how to de even deal with the pandemic. You know, what is appropriate behavior, where to go, what to do. So I gave you an example of hand washing being less important than we thought it was. You know? Yeah. So it, it's really like you're learning on the job in this. And you're at, and people who are highly critical of the science in the pandemic need to understand the following. You knew nothing about that this damn virus when it came in last year. And yes. how rapidly people learned about it. Why were initially all kinds of drugs used? Because you theoretically thought this might work on this principle, that principle. And over next few months, six months, eight months, one year studies came out showing this worked, this did, did not work. So you cannot say that, you know, last year you told me this, this year you're telling me. It is true. That's how science is. What about HIV? It took so long to figure out what works. Here, you're dealing with something affecting everybody. So you're trying to learn on the job. Initially, you will say, it makes sense. This drug might work. Let's use this. And then you find maybe it's working. The other important problem, the other important point in this is when people are just clinicians and they're just treating a patient and they think it works. Patient is also happy, but it's also possible the patient got okay on their own. Yeah, exactly. So, plasma so banks were being set up, no? Plasma banks were being set up and everything. And then they said, no, plasma doesn't work. So you, so you, took no medication. you took no medication, I remember, right? You took nothing. Yeah. So, so because I, I, I said, you don't need to. And so the thing is that we had learned. Uh, yeah. That the first we, I were make hydroxychloroquine. I was a great proponent. It should work logically. Turned out to be useless. I were make it almost useless. Uh, vitamin C, D, zinc, iron, everyone's taking that stuff. I mean, I don't say no, but I don't know how it's going to help. And suddenly you're worried that maybe taking the zinc is enhancing black fungus, taking the iron is enhancing black. So, you know, I think we have to stick to the basics. And this yes. is happening. It's much clearer now than it was last year. So if we are, last year I, I told somebody to take a particular drug and this year I said, don't take it. That's how science is. So you have to appreciate and admire. People say vaccines, whether they work or not. Where have you developed vaccines in one year? I mean, unheard of. Less than a year. Exactly. Had... But so, Doc, is there anything at all that we can do to, uh, you know, make our uh, system stronger to be uh, able to cope with whatever is, uh, is there in the future, in, you know, the third wave? So to, do, to make our system stronger, it, it does make sense to, to have a healthy diet, do those basics. If you have diabetes, make sure it's well controlled. In our own studies, we found diabetes to be a major predictor of adverse outcomes. If, if you have blood pressure, make sure it's well controlled. So I call it a syndemic, a combination of two pandemics, because it is the virus, but it's also hitting those who already have these conditions uh, uh, pre-existing. So make sure those are well controlled. That's do some deep breathing, do some stretching, do some physical exercise, whatever you can in the house or in the neighboring park. Make sure you do that. Don't give up on that. Make sure you eat healthy and not putting on weight at home. And, and uh, uh, wear your mask. <laughs> wear your mask all the time and avoid indoor gatherings. So people think, you know, somehow, somehow intuitively we think, this is my friend, this is my brother. 
I mean, you know, he can't be. I mean, he's just come from next next door or the next colony or whatever. And there's, but most infections that happen from people known to each other. So that is something that we have to be indoor, careful indoor, about. Indoor. And when you meet and when you take off your mask to have a drink together or something, that's a problem. Unless everyone is vaccinated in that room and dub double vaccinated and both shots and two weeks after that, we should avoid that. So okay. that's strenuous, but that's the way it is. Okay. Okay. Doc, how are we doing for time? Because I'm worried more questions will come in. Onindita, questions? Yeah, yeah, there are questions. I can see the questions. Oh, I can't. So I can take them if you like. I can see them here. Why don't you do that, Doc? Yeah. So uh, there's a question from Archana Dalmia. Uh, why is there so much confusion from different sections about drugs like ivermectin being protective or the other confusion about the third way? Is, there, is, it, is everyone just sitting in the dark? There is no research for long-term effects. So, okay. Uh, yeah, I think what you're saying is absolutely right. But the truth is, among the scientists now, there is little confusion that ivermectin is more or less useless. You can use it. It's not a very dangerous drug to use. But the, there is clear evidence based on studies that it really doesn't do much. You will always have some people saying that, you know, it works. And, you know, uh, there is this gentleman in France who said hydroxychloroquine will cure everything. And there are hiding data. And, and then there are conspiracy theories about uh, multinationals and doctors and China and all being hand in glove. I don't think any conspiracy theory can explain this whole thing. So for the moment, for the moment, uh, it is, uh, uh, for the moment, it's important to remember that these things will happen. Uh, but at the moment, uh, ivermectin is not a recommended drug. Third wave, yes, everyone is guessing, but there are specialists for that. The epidemiologists and the virologists, I'm not a specialist in that. So I'm going by what my colleagues who are specialists, they tell me, they do say exactly what I'm saying. But that's I'm just saying it out of common sense, but they 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 confirmed that that if it's not a variant, then it'll be manageable. There will be a third wave. But if it's a delta plus variant and that decides to sort of hit us again, then we are in trouble. So that's the thing. So it's not groping in the dark. The fact is you're learning on the job. How do you know the answers? You don't know the answers unless you've been through it. I mean, diabetes has been around for forever from Charak's time. Egyptians described it. But we are still searching for answers. So in, when you go for evidence-based medicine, this is the search that happens. And therefore, there will be confusion. But it's important to listen to the recognized experts in that field, read the correct literature. Unfortunately, with social media, there is so much wrong information. Exactly. Today, I wrote about, please don't give up your mask on Twitter. And someone attacked me like with 20 responses. The masking is a fraud. and the, Whatever, all kinds of stuff. So, so you really can't do take that chance. You know, you please follow people whom you trust and you who are reliable. Uh, ah, Sunaina says it'll be wonderful to do a book on photography. You have, that you've done. It'll be amazing. Well, let's. let's. I know that we've already discussed it. <laughs> <laughs> so, Natasha Bhatti wants to know: Is it true that even post-recovery complications are coming up? Yes, they are. Uh, this is another challenge because we are finding post recovery a dragging on kind of thing, you know, dragging on kind of thing where the, the, the effects continue. And sometimes after three weeks, again, people are getting fever. Then there are a whole lot of things about brain fog and other things, clotting about heart issues. I don't want to sound like negative or, uh, or pessimistic in this, but we really don't know which way it's going to go. At the moment, a lot of things that are being called post-COVID could just be anxiety and, you know, uh, you know, this brain fog and uh, tiredness could just be anxiety with the environment situation. We don't know. Jobs, home situations for people. But some of it is genuine and quite clearly post-COVID is a problem. Uh, but I'm sure we can tackle that. It is a problem that has to be recognized. Uh, it can be the brain, it can be the heart, it can be your diabetes. Some people, diabetes just flares up during COVID and doesn't go back so easily. So, so there are lots of things, neuromuscular, muscle weakness and, and uh, you know, myalgia and those kind of things sometimes persist. So yes, after recovery also sometimes problems happen. Vanita Yadav, uh, considering that the third wave is expected to hit the children at large, that's created a fear of psychosis among parents. I think this is a good question. 
again there is no evidence right now that the third wave will preferentially hit children there is no evidence i have not only am i saying this on my own but i have confirmed this with the virologists who are who deal with this who predict these things and it's common sense again there is no reason for a virus to preferentially affect children the reason why in america they are preparing for the third wave is because the children are not vaccinated and if children are not vaccinated they are obviously if they are going to be the only carrier then it's a problem the only people affected but otherwise there is no preferential choice of the th- even in, even this time we think the second wave wave affected youngsters much more but it's not true if you look at the total number of cases the proportion of young people is the same it is just that the number of people was so much larger 5 6 10 times larger that you know you got young people also uh, swept away and deepa mishra wants to know uh the pandemic has really affected the children especially small kids they couldn't go out and sit in front of the screen for a long time and tired is very stressful yeah that is absolutely correct i mean really uh, i think that has been one of the huge long term impacts of the pandemic that till february 2020 you were telling your kids not to spend time in front of the screen and now suddenly all their education is also through there so yes we have to sort of make sure that our kids are getting some physical exposure and now that going out is allowed that they are going out in the park they are doing some physical sport it's very important yes otherwise it's it, it can really you're absolutely right it's a big challenge and a lot of pediatricians and child psychologists are working on that uh, but uh, you have to make sure that you keep the environment light and not heavy and maybe focus on studies can we take a little bit of a back seat because you know if you are performance driven and if you are doing it all through virtual it can be very strenuous so i think we need to take and i really think that the main uh, way to deal with that is to get them fresh air take them out with a mask in the park or whatever is close by you know play football do something for a little while open air infections are distinctly uncommon in between there was this thing about the virus being in the air don't go out you know i remember people were closing their windows no 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 it's not open air infection especially if you are wearing a mask unless you are standing together and having tea or something you know which is common after morning walks and all in our society the risk is very low so if you are in the open air with friends with a mask typically it's good to say hi to somebody and not walk with them all the time but if you are just two of you and both of you are either vaccinated or protected in other ways there's no problem but for kids it's important to go out and play even during the pandemic now open air infection they can wear a mask the level of activity might come down but it otherwise it's it is very uh, taxing for the children and could have long term implications uh yes so uh, same question i've already answered any particular reason younger people were affected this time more as compared to the first wave in absolute numbers yes but as a proportion it was the same when i looked even at our own hospital data and now government data is out the number of the proportion of say if there were 100 people affected last time and 100 this time the number of young people was still about 20 30 mm. right but the numbers were so large this time that we had enough young people affected so we already answered that right uh is it okay to walk with a thin mask outdoors yes okay so uh, i think we are reaching that stage but at the moment i would still stick to double mask and or n95 but in the last wave when it was over we were walking with thin masks and it was quite okay i think we wait a little bit but i think that day is not far off when we'll be able to walk with a, a thin cloth mask or a surgical mask for the moment i would suggest no uh, when you're going out uh, please wear your mask but let me tell you this morning when i uh, shared that picture of the peacock with you ina uh, this morning i found five people properly masked during my walk and 23 who were either not masked or their masks were hanging yet yeah, some of them didn't even weren't even carrying anything so there is something about our psyche which which invites trouble so i can't yes one can yeah. help yes yes are we through with the questions i can't see yes. any Yes. Uh, in the Q and A, we are uh, over with the questions. I have one small question: that uh, what are the most important precautions one can take after uh, post recovery? 
Yes, I think that's important. Post-recovery, uh, our mental health is very important. So again, you have to try and relax and do things that you enjoy. Uh, it's also a time where you can enjoy music or reading or whatever you like to do. That's important. The other thing is, unlike many other situations where we ask people to push themselves and get back on track, staff, people who deal with large number, I deal with a fair medium number of people, but you know, I have, I'm responsible for them in a way. How soon should they come back to work, even yeah. if they're from the infectious phase. So I think you have to be careful. In COVID, you cannot push. You have to listen to your body. And the other thing you can do is breathing exercises are very important post-recovery. Uh, as a physical measure, some degree of physical activity, whichever your body permits. But breathing exercises are very important. A healthy, nutritious diet, good protein intake. If you're not a diabetic, lots of fruits uh, you know, and vegetables for everybody. Those are the basics. And if you feel any sign, don't ignore it. Like if you feel, for example, if you feel pain in your sinus, which wasn't there, at least talk to your doctor or send him a picture of your face or something, you know. So that is important that we should not ignore any sign. We should not become hypochondriacs and paranoid, but we should make a list of anything new that we feel and talk to our doctor about it. Right. Uh, the most common uh, thing that we've heard uh, from people who uh, were positive and now recovered is that they feel very weak. So which uh, actually, uh, how does it affect the system? Why, do, why does it make them so weak? I mean, even after fever, one feels the weakness, but it gets over in a couple of weeks. But people who recover from, uh, you know, uh, positive, COVID positive, they have this tremendous weakness in them. So which part of area is so affected that, uh, you know, they feel this weakness? So it's actually the body itself, the, the, the nerves, the muscles, the brain. And this is because of the extraordinary inflammatory response that this virus excites. It's not the virus itself. The virus is there for a week or so, typically. And then the virus, but it, it triggers a response. And that inflammatory response is responsible for most of the, of the fatalities that you that you've seen most of the most of the mortality that you've seen so so i it's 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 the inflammatory response persistence of that in minor degrees that causes extreme weakness which means there there are substances circulating in the body that that excite inflammation in your muscle you know like you get during fever right. Right. so so that is why uh, this virus is bad plus if you've been on steroids which will get you sometimes out of this crisis when you withdraw steroids, that also, if you've taken steroids for a few weeks and then you've withdrawn, you will feel weak for another few weeks. Not uncommon at all. Mm -hmm. Whenever you take steroids for more than seven days, it leaves behind a certain, because there's a withdrawal. Then you feel a certain weakness and you know, because steroids give you a high. And then your appetite goes down and you might lose some weight after that. So that is another contributory factor. So... You know, there are issues. Also, it is very common uh, um, in people uh, who have known who have uh, been unlucky to have got that infection that uh, they are given blood thinners. What are the reasons for blood thinners? Yeah, I mean, the use of blood thinners is a bit uh, sort of iffy in general. It's not like a firmly established thing for everybody, but certain people do require it because there is a tendency in some people to form blood clots. Okay. Because of the again the inflammatory markers going up and the vessels and the the blood cells that flow being affected in a way that it can clot and therefore people who have a, who have a risk of that kind of situation, especially people who are uh, you know diabetic, hypertensive, they have often been given blood thinners after this. Uh, especially if there are some blood markers, the doctors see and then decide whether. Uh, they require to do that or not. Mm -hmm. But it's also true that there are some young people who got clots. And you couldn't, I mean, you know, so it's very bizarre. And you can't. Which is why testing is so important, doctor. You keep insisting that we do tests very often right. through the entire duration of the infection. So we have another question on the screen that uh, Inna in Singh is asking a young couple tested positive for the second time after a few months. Do they have to take extra post-COVID precautions? Well, this is a very unfortunate, and we're also seeing this. Uh, people who had had COVID in September, even today I saw two patients like that who had COVID again in, in May, you know. 
So, so which means that these are people who had the infection twice. It's not the same virus persisting. It cannot persist for so long unless someone is really sick or immunocompromised. It can go for a few more weeks, but not several months. So probably mild infection that happened both times. I don't think you can do anything different. In fact, uh, if one was to make light of it, if you got it twice, then you probably have very solid immunity now. Right, and, right. And we, look, at, uh, look at it positively. Right. Uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, but it is happening. Right. That's why I'm saying boosters will almost certainly be required. That's my guess. Okay. And I had one more, uh, you know, uh, question that which uh, comorbidity, uh, comorbidities uh, escalate the chances of being infected? So I think that's a great question. Now, when we talk of chances of catching the infection, the common comorbidities which I'm going to list, none of them we are sure if they increase your chance of getting the infection. Right. But they increase the chance of adverse outcomes if you get infected. So there is a distinction there. The distinction is that, that if you, okay, let's say there are two people and both, both are 60 years old. One doesn't have any diabetes, depression, heart disease, the other one does have that. So the chances and both get infected from the same source, the chances that the person who has these comorbidities, which are obesity, Diabetes, blood pressure, chronic kidney disease, heart disease. Of course, don't forget the lungs. Uh, they are the main yeah. organ here. If you have these comorbidities, our own data on 400 consecutive patients admitted last year in the first wave showed that of all those who succumbed to the illness, the bulk were those who had either diabetes or blood pressure or both together mm -hmm. and, and or kidney disease. So, so uh, the Clumping together of comorbidities really impacts our outcome, but it really doesn't make you very much more prone to catch the infection. So, uh, Ina, do you have any more questions? We don't I think we've time. asked him so many questions already, and I'm so grateful that, Doc, you've taken the time out to be with us. I'm sure, I mean, it's, it's a very, very busy day. It's a weekday, and I'm so grateful that you accepted our invitation. No, it's been a pleasure, and... Uh, uh, to interact with all of you. The questions have been brilliant and Inna, as usual, uh, has been uh, uh, as uh, sort of fluent and as uh, erudite and eloquent as she always is. <laughs> thank you, Doctor. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, one last thing that I would la uh, like to ask, uh, these home remedies that everybody is suggesting for uh, COVID, a prevention of COVID or the Ayurvedic medicines that have come up in the market, how helpful are they? Uh, in one line, the answer is we really don't know. There is no evidence at all. Right. So the reason why science keeps changing is because evidence keeps changing. Right. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately for these, no one likes to do any studies. And the answer they give me is that it is 5,000 years old. इसमें क्या गलत सकता है तो 5000 साल पुराना ना तो हमारा गट का बैक्टीरिया वैसे है अभी ना जो आप पत्ती तुलसी की लोरी वो सेम है ना आप जो उसमें मिला सो एवरीथिंग हैज चेंज चेंज इज 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 द हॉलमार्क ऑफ प्रोग्रेस सो आई थिंक व्हाइल आई हैव नथिंग पर्सनली अगेंस्ट एनी ऑफ दीस रेमेडीज बट आई डाउट इट इफ वी हैव एनी अनलेस वी डेवलप एविडेंस फॉर समवन लाइक मी हु इज ट्रेंड लाइक दैट इट इज वेरी डिफिकल्ट टू एक्सेप्ट दैट दिस विल मेक एनी डिफरेंस um, uh, something else from uh, COVID. Uh, since you have researched so much on vitamin D and its effect and its, uh, you know, uh, uh, requirements, so uh, what would you suggest for uh, common people um, for intake of vitamin D apart from taking a, a you know, fortnightly medicine? So, so the vitamin D story, when we first described in the mid to late 90s, the vitamin D deficiency, when I was teaching at Sanjay Gandhi PGI Lucknow, uh, so they sent back the paper saying that uh, this is not possible, India is such a sunny country. Uh, so we had to take, and you must have made a measure, uh, diff, uh, mistake in your measurement. So we took the samples to London and to uh, Detroit and had them rechecked by colleagues to prove that India had significant D deficiency. No one believed that. Mm. And gradually we know that urban Indians, when I moved to Delhi, 
again uh, 20 more than 20 years ago 21 22 years ago the, there was the vitamin d assay was not widely available i asked dr lal to start doing that test and then dr dang so so what we understand now is that vitamin d deficiency in urban indians is very common there is no need to hype it it's not the cause for everything we, you go to the other extreme and you know people my college, students tell me sir you have unleashed a monster because people are linking even divorce to vitamin d deficiency now so so that's not correct vitamin d is important for our bones for our muscle and for our immunity to some extent so so there is no vitamin d in indian diets so all the articles your nutritionist friends write in all these portals which they keep coming to me uh, how to improve your vitamin D, you cannot improve it by with diet. There is no vitamin D in Indian diets, first point. Second point is that to get vitamin D, you need the sun. Which sun do you need? You need, best sun is not, again, everyone says, morning sun is best. Chhat pe ja ke namaskar karo, to ho jayega. But the sun that gives you maximum vitamin D is between 11 a.m. and 3 p.m. Now, how will you and I go in the sun at that time? Either we give up, give up our work or we get ourselves, uh, you know, sunburned or something. So, so it is a challenge to get vitamin. So the source is that. So there are two options for us. Yes, increase your sunlight exposure. And then if you apply as most uh, elegant women, like all of you do, uh, apply sunscreen, then you don't make any vitamin D again. Okay. So, so, so uh, you need to either make sure you're having fortified food, which the government is now going to make mandatory, but it is at the moment it is uh, volitional. Uh, you add uh, vitamin D to milk, there is fortified food available now. So milk definitely, most, most uh, dairies are now uh, fortifying uh, their milk with vitamin D. So we should go for that, number one. And the other is, yes, if you're in a vulnerable age group, like the elderly or growing children. These are the two most important. Like if you're in that 60 postmenopausal age group, 50 plus, or you know, you probably should take some vitamin D. And if you're a growing adolescent and you're not getting sunlight exposure, you should take some vitamin D. These are groups that are very and pregnant women should take some vitamin D. So maybe everybody, but at least these people should. And the last point here, which I will say is that vitamin D is grossly overused. Either it's not there or it's overprescribed because the dose that we require is 2,000 units a day. One to 2,000 units a day. And what is prescribed commonly is 60,000 every week. And there is a common knowledge. Common knowledge is where did it come from? It was used by us. That is for treatment. This is for maintenance for people who don't have symptoms. So 1,000 to 2,000 units a day, even if you take 2,000 as a safe cutoff, which means that 60,000 dollar pill or sachet, hai, take it once a month or take a pill that has 2,000 a day and you never get d -deficient. I think for us, for a public health program, for schools and all we are suggesting, once a month, go and give them that sachet finished in school. You don't require anything else. Same thing we can all do. So there is D-deficiency, it's important. It's not a panic situation. But it's foolish not to correct it, especially during the pandemic. So a dose of about 2,000 IU a day or 60,000 once a month is fine. Okay. That was very informative. And um, uh, Anandita, I think with that, we come to the end of this session. Yes, I am. Uh, yeah? Yeah. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Mittal and uh, Ina. Thank you so much. So on behalf of the foundation, I would like to thank Dr. Ambrish Mittal and Ms. Inapuri for an interesting and uh, invigorating conversation. I would also like to thank our presenter, she Cement Limited. And lastly, I would like to thank the audience whose never ending support has made these sessions possible. Thank you very much, all of you. Thank you, sir. And uh, thank, thank you. you very, thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. It was uh, indeed an enlightening session. Apart from COVID, we learned so much from you, and uh, which we must and we should and we will incorporate in our daily lives. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.